journalism, uh, Dr. Jackie Lohman has been a professional communicator for most of her life. Um, she has worked in a broad range of areas, including newspapers, journals, publishing houses, and the Academy, of course. In 2008, she created the University of Maine of Prince Kyle's Professional Communication and Journalism Program. That's what UMPI, by the way, stands for when I started. Um, I will let her tell you the details of her inspiring life, but during a long process of recovery in 2012, uh, Dr. Lohman formed the ideas that led to the creation of Beyond Limits, Awaken Your Potential. Uh, this is a 501c3 that views the challenge as an opportunity. In 2017, a Beyond Limits team will through hike the Appalachian Trail. Team members will follow in and out over the seven month hike, but Ms. Lohman and her service dog, Saint, will be the only constant members of the team. Project goals include education, hope, and demonstration that nothing is impossible. So please join me in giving a warm unity cause welcome to Jackie Lohman. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. Now is this working? Yep. Okay, great. Um, thank you that, for that nice introduction. When you said about a special guest, Saint thought you were talking about her. So she's got <laughs> a, a, little, a little bit of an ego I'm here. Me one more time. She said, if you don't have food in your hand, I don't want anything to oh, do with you. She likes me. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is our, our logo we have for Beyond Limits, Awaken Your Potential. So it doesn't matter which way I point this? Okay. Okay. And so uh, a little bit about how we came to be. And some of these quotes that are on these slides are things that are on our website. Um, different principles that we believe in. See? Apparently your feet are amazing. Okay. Um, so as, as um, uh, President Corey mentioned, um, I am a teacher at UMPI and uh, really enjoy teaching. I teach communication. I enjoy working with students. And I hear from students a lot about things that they can't do. You know, I can't do this. I can't do that. Uh, and I'm, I'm very prone, I think you're on my microphone, right? um, to saying that there's no such thing as can't. But the can't that holds us back is things in our, in our minds. Um, so my, a little bit of my background, as a, as a child, I was um, educated in the resource room, I guess is what people call it now, because I had different physical challenges and people didn't know what the challenges were and they didn't know what the causes of these things were. And so um, I was um, deemed, um, oh, it's not a nice way to put it, but cognitively challenged, slow, not able to go to college or hold a job. And so I heard a lot of can't. Um, and my whole thing is, if, if you're a child and you hear this can't, you believe it because it's people older and wiser and stronger and everything. And so, um, so by the time I became an adult, that can't was here. Um, fortunately for me, I had my parents, and so they always said, whatever you decide you want to do, you can do. So I did go to college, did get a job, and life was good. Uh, and my, my physical challenges had gotten more and more significant. So I've been a wheelchair user for a long, long time. Um, and found out along the way some of the, the causes of it. And so it wasn't a cognitive impairment. It was spina bifida, scoliosis, things like that. But in 2012, I started feeling kind of bad, physically not good. And I'm pretty, uh, my students hate it because I never miss school. I'm always there. You know, they don't get any d classes off because I'm sick. And so, but I started missing work. And when I would eat, I would have pain. And then I would have like really bad heartburn. And I kept thinking, well, I'm allergic to, you know, I kept thinking that was different things I was eating. And so I was eliminating more and more things from my diet until basically I was eating saltines and ginger ale, which is not a good diet. Um, and I was supposed to go to a conference in October in Hawaii. And it's like, oh man, this is already great. Um, but I was getting sicker and sicker. And I had a couple of trips to the emergency room and the, the week before I was supposed to go to Hawaii, uh, I had to go to the emergency room t one, one, the Monday before. And I was there overnight, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong. And every time I went, they would do an EKG, and they would say, well, it's not your heart. And I, know I, I know it's not my heart. 
So the Thursday before my trip, um, I was at school, and it was October, and I was really, uh, I got very hot, which is really unusual because I'm always cold, and I was sweating. And I went home, and my mom was still alive, and I asked my mother to, to look after the dogs, and I went up to lie down to just till I felt better. And the pain was very, very strong. And every time I tried to get up to help myself, I would faint from the pain. So Saint kept me alive overnight because she kept reviving me. She kept, it sounds kind of funny, but she kept dropping things on me. Because, you know, if you're kind of out of it, you, you say things like, oh, I'm okay, I'm okay, but you're not okay. So she knew that. So she revived me until I was strong enough and could keep conscious long enough to call for help. So I got into the hospital and they took blood work. And uh, your hemoglobin is supposed to be like a 12. And my hemoglobin was a 5. And they said, you're bleeding somewhere, you know, badly. And so they admitted me. And they did some tests. And it was a Friday. And I said, I got to get out of the hospital because I need to go to this conference. Um, and on Saturday, they were doing tests. And I went back in my room. And I didn't feel well at all. And then all the alarms started going off. And the people came running in. And they all looked really frightened. Um, and I was bleeding from everything. Um, so shorten this, I got life flighted to Bangor from northern Maine. Uh, and when they put me on the plane, nobody thought I would get off alive. And I did. Um, but the blood loss was so strong that so much that I lost my ability to move or speak. And the inability to speak for me was even more of a challenge than the inability to move. And so I had to go through a very long rehabilitation process, physical rehabilitation. Uh, and my, my body movement came back more easily than the speaking. And so it wasn't a stroke, but it was so much blood loss. And so over this long rehab, I had a lot of time to think. And I realized that I had what most people don't get. I had a second chance to do something. And so that's when Beyond Limits really got going, because I thought, I need to do more than teach. And I love teaching. Um, and I'm not a terrible teacher. Good thing my students aren't here. They can't disagree with me. Um, but there needed to be something else. And so I was always saying to people, can't is just here. And I thought, well, I need to demonstrate this. So the first thing that we did was we decided that, I say we, and that would be Saint and me, we decided, we, we went whitewater rafting. I mentioned this earlier today. And, and everyone's like, oh, that's so brave. It's not brave at all. They throw you in a raft. You hang on. You know, you get through it. If you, if you don't fall out, you know, and if you fall out, they throw you back in. So it's not brave. Um, and it's very short. You know, you get through the rapids, and people say, oh, it's over. It's like, it's over? Um, and so decided that we needed to climb Mount Katahdin. So people in here who have climbed Mount Katahdin, hands, please. Oh, lots of people. This is great. Because most of the time I, I talk about this, and most of the time people haven't climbed it. And, um, uh, very few of my students have, and most of them are Mainers, and they haven't done it. So we decided we needed to do this. And we heard a lot of can't. You can't do that. Because we were going to be a team, and it's really important that we're a team. It's not about me. It's about a group. But we were going to do this climb with somebody, an adult, who couldn't walk. And so it's how can you do this? And so we had to, and we'll show you after we have some of the gear that we used, we had to come up with a special carrying device. Uh, because people would, were going to have to carry me up this mountain. And so. Um, there was a lot of planning that went into it. We planned for over a year. And ultimately, we had a team of 16, including me. And so, um, and everybody else was a hiker and fit. And they could have run up and down that mountain in a half a day. And with us, we, were, we knew that we would need at least three days, because we would need to hike in, camp, and then do the summit and descent, and then hike out the third day. And so. We had to look at it in a completely different way. Um, and so the recruiting was interesting. We needed people that had the right stuff. Um, they had to be humble. They had to be good in a team. Um, the physical part wasn't as, as challenging as the mental, their, their outlook on life. 
And so we were really, really, I always would say lucky, but maybe it wasn't just luck because people heard about it and they wanted to be a part of it. And so we did the climb. We started planning it in June of 2014 and we actually did it in July of 2015. And so this is a video. It's about 10 minutes long. Um, but it shows how we did it, and I think you'll be really interested to see how these guys, how it happened. And so, um, yep. So this is Roaring Brook Campground. And I'm in the carrier, obviously. And the, the way that this it works, you have to hug the person because you can't be sitting upright or you're going to be pulling back on them. And so, and there's Saints. So we had 16 people all together. Um, we had six porters. We had six guys carrying. And then we had uh, a couple of ladies there to help Saint and me a little bit. And then we had people that carried all of our stuff in and out for us. And so here we're making adjustments to the carrier. It's great, but it's not very stable. And so. And they would switch out about every 10 minutes. So. No one got overly tired. The guy in front, Ethan, was our timekeeper, and so he would keep track of where people were. And if it was particularly bad terrain, then maybe people wouldn't do 10 minutes. Uh, but in general, it was 10 minutes each. The person that doesn't have a pack on would be the next person to carry. And so there was some, some rest in there. And so these are people that are packing in food and, and um, the other things that we use, sleeping bags. And Saint is on a ski during harness which was incredible for Saint because she's used to being on a short leash. So this was just like, wow, this is fantastic. So this shows us the, how people swapped in and out. So two people at least would be supporting my weight. One person would step out and the other person would step in. And they got really good at that. They could do it in less than a minute, even when we were going up the saddle slide to, to get to the top. It was, it was challenging because you can see everyone has a somewhat different body type and so they would get it on and they would have to try to make these adjustments um, as they went along. So this was our, our first day and it was pretty easy. You know, it's going into Chimney Pond and so it's, it's hiking but it's not, it's not too bad, certainly. We were so lucky with the weather. It really wasn't that hot. Um, and we had reserved the bunkhouse and a lean-to at Ch uh, Chimney Pond for a week because we were, wanted to take the best three days. And so we, we didn't know until, we had reserved from Monday to Monday and we didn't decide till Sunday that we were gonna go the next day and so. We were really lucky um, both days. The, the third day when we hiked out, it rained a little bit. Those are some of the other people that were part of our group. They couldn't stay with us because they have a 12-person rule. And so they had to stay at Roaring Brook. And so we couldn't be all together with that many people. And here we are, like, yeah, we made it. And so everyone's really relieved. That's why everyone's slapping hands. Um, when we started, we didn't know how long it would take to get in there. And we were hoping that we could do it in six hours, 
It's not, um, and we did it in three. So people were really excited about that. Um, I mentioned to a previous group today that these guys had done a practice hike two weeks before and they came back and they said, there's no way we're gonna be able to do it. It's just too steep, it's just too hard. Um, I weigh around 100 pounds, maybe a little less, but there's no way to climb this thing carrying 100 pounds on your back. But we did so well going into Chimney Pond that they decided to try it. Um, and we decided that we would, we would have to turn around by noon, even though it was July and it, the days are long, we just didn't want to push it. Yes, one of my students, um, you, you see a guy with a fancy camera and that was Bill Green's cameraman, but one of my students went along with his GoPro and, and did this. And this group of people, um, there are people that heard about it, word of mouth, we recruited people. Uh, Ethan, the, the youngest guy, was a student at UMPI. Um, I knew some of these people before we started this, and some of them, um, Rod, the, the, the bulkiest guy, heard about it a month before and wanted to be a part of it. And so there was training, but everybody never got together all at once to train. So the way they were able to work together, I just think is extraordinary. Um, and they did a lot of it without a lot of verbalization. It was just like, okay, we know what we need to do. So I wasn't able to see any of this. We took a rest break, and then that's when we, I could turn around and say, wow, look at that, Chimney Pond down there. And so um, we, we all had something you know, to eat and a drink, and then we, we started up again. And as we're getting up there, it's getting harder, and then we got to this, and this is, um, I couldn't appreciate it as much until I saw the film, because I was on people's backs, but, um, So coming up the saddle slide and getting to the tablelands, it's just like, okay, this is, this is, um, but you still got a mile to go and it's, it's not as hard as climbing up, but it's all uh, stuff that moves a lot with you walking on it. So, but we're, we're feeling good at this point, like this is going to be okay. Um, and you can see that I'm, I'm hugging Ethan, it's like, thank you, thank you. Um, We made it to the sign by 10.30, so I'm not sure what time it was, but, and so that was, to me, that was just amazing that we started at eight, we said we needed to turn around at noon, and we were, we were there by, by 10.30, and so, um, and so, um, I'm crying, and other people were crying as well, because it was just one of these things that everyone was just like, my gosh, this is fantastic. Um, And they're talking to me about my dad. My dad died in 1973, but my father always said, whatever you want to do, you can do. So I thought a lot about my father, you know, being up there. And my father was from Utah and was a big person in terms of mountains. Um, going down, I think, was even more extraordinary than going up. Um, because going down on the very steep parts, the person carrying me had to turn face into the, the mountain. And so he couldn't see where to put his hands and feet and so had to trust other people to put his hands and feet, well, his hands not, but his feet for him. And so um, the way they, they moved together um, in terms of teamwork was just, as I say, really extraordinary. Um, and some of the people would go ahead and like, this is the best way to go because this is loose, you don't want to walk there. You notice none of them used poles at all in the hiking because they were afraid that if, if they fell or, or slipped that the pole would go into me. So they made a decision not to do that.
once you once we get back to the tree line, it's like okay, it's 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 not as as bad. It's not as difficult. Um, and so Saint didn't go to the top, but. Um, I was really embarrassed because what I didn't drink enough because I was on people's backs and I thought, oh, I'm not sweating, you know, I'm not walking, but I didn't realize that I'm absorbing all their heat, and so I didn't drink enough. And then coming down, one of the guys I was on kept spinning, and so I got between motion sick and dehydrated, I got sick. So we stopped, and one of the guys ran back to the base camp and got Saint. So this is Saint, like, it's okay, mommy, we're all right. And so that's where she's giving me. Yeah, and she's, okay. So um, now that's the end of that. And so the third day, as I said, we hiked out. I was really lucky. Whoops, wrong way. Okay. Um, I was lucky because I, I came back from being dehydrated really quickly. I didn't realize um, until afterwards that people were really concerned about that. And I was. I was ready to, to go the next day. And so we hiked out. It was a little drizzly, but not bad. And as you can see from the, the video, the view was amazing that day. It was a little bit closed in, but, but not bad at all. So we got done with this, and it's like, OK, what do we do next? And one of the things that um, was very powerful to me was the whole team part, and that every person involved was really transformed by the experience. Even though they were people that were amazingly fit and strong and athletic, they all felt that they had gone beyond their limits. And so we, we needed to do something else. We needed to kind of build on that. And so um, when we got down off Katahdin, someone said to me pretty early on, are you ever going to do Katahdin again? And I said, no, why would I do Katahdin? You know, I've done it once. I'm not going to do it again. Um, and and I, I maintained that resolve for about of months. And then I went to a talk in October of last year, and there was a guy talking about through hiking the Appalachian Trail. And I said to Saint, that's it. Um, years and years and years and years ago, when I was very young and I could still walk a little bit, I'd been on the Appalachian Trail you know, for a little, a little piece of it. And then I put that in the back of my mind because you know, I can't walk, I can't do that. And so I thought, well, we need to do that, but we need to do it because it's a long and a lot more people could be involved in it because we only had 16 people the first time around and we wanted to do something that could involve people at colleges and universities all along the eastern seaboard or anywhere. So that's what we decided to do. And I had a class in the last spring. The battle plan is the logistics of doing it because it's, it's a complicated, it's 2,190 miles. And we would need a lot of people to do it. And then there's the food and the supplies and everything. So my students um, took this on as a sp in a spring class. And so all about the journey. And so this is one of the first things we did in the class. And this is a mind map. So it's very tiny. I apologize for that. But you can see the, the budget. Home base would be the, the, the logistical center on the trail, and then we've got all these different things coming off of it, you know, equipment, um, and then the equipment down to uh, hygiene, food, cooking, tents, all these different pieces. Um, the home base would also be in charge of a database with everybody's information. Because to make this feasible, we knew that we would need to have lots of, lots of groups along the way, lots of teams. So the, the constant would be Saint and me we couldn't have more than 10 people because there are places that you can't have more than 10 people. So we just, OK, that's our upper number. And so we would need groups of nine people every two weeks. And we decided two weeks because to have that team experience, you'd need to be part of it for more than just a few days. And so, so this was one of the first things that they did. And so and here's the Appalachian Trail with all of the different sections. And one of my students, there are lots of good apps out there, that things that you can, can buy. But one of my students uh, undertook to make a, a customized interactive map. And so that's got all this, you know, the, the, the elevations and, and all these different things about the trail 
and pictures of all the different shelters and um, places that you can resupply. And so um, he took some things that were out there and kind of pulled them together and did some of his own things as well. Um, we also needed to do uh, a weekly timeline. And we know that this is just guesstimation because stuff happens always. But in order to help people kind of wrap their heads around it, if you say to people, well, we're going to do this, and like, well, how? And, and how far are you going to go? And so we tried to plan it out week by week. And we needed to be able reasonably to let people know where we would be at the end of two weeks so that if we had a new team of people coming in, they'd know where to meet us. And so my students, some of them will be working on this from Presque Isle. You know, they'll be managing the data. And so if something happens and we can't get to the exact spot, they'll be able to let another group of people know. But we needed to break it down. And so the colors are, um, there's a, you can't see this because it's, it's embedded, but at the bottom there's a, a, a color key that explains which state is which color. And so we've got that. Um, and there's also a calendar that um, where we would be week by week so that people could look at this and say, oh, I've got a couple of weeks during this time and, and I, c I could do this. Okay. Um, we have team positions. We started calling them job descriptions, but we can't actually pay people to do this. And we thought job sounds like we're going to pay you. And so we changed it to this. And so there are a number of different, there's trail hiker, there's hospitality hiker, there's um, trail support coordinator, and um, trail volunteers. And so we need to break it down into different things. And so a trail volunteer could be somebody who has a couple of hours or maybe a day. Um, for the people who are hikers or the, uh, the trail support coordinator, we were asking people for a two-week commitment, and people could do it longer if people wanted to do it for an internship. Fantastic. Um, one of the things I mentioned to an earlier class today was happy to work with anybody to make that feasible so people could get academic credit, uh, or if people are just trying to you know, find themselves or whatever it is. We want to pull in a lot of people for this. And so we've got these positions, and then there's something there. It's, uh, and again, it's, this is just a, a picture of it. And so there's a volunteer form that people can fill out to express their interest. They can look at the team positions and the timeline. So we wanted to make it so that people could kind of wrap their head around it. And so this is a picture of the volunteer form that people can fill out. And um, that's pretty, I think, self-explanatory. And so the idea is that if people fill this out, Ultimately, we want to talk to each person. And so it's face-to-face -face or Google Hangout just to have a conversation. But this is a good starting point. Um, something that my, nice plug for Unity here. Um, we created a, an outreach submission form this summer, my work study and I. And so I emailed uh, about 200 colleges and universities over the summer. And when I first told my students about this, they're like, 200, what's the big deal? But they were individual, and it was hard sometimes to find the emails for people. And so I got contacts through College Board, places that had outdoor recreation or environmental recreation or adventure or something like that, or the Association for Experiential Education. So uh, people that would have an interest in this kind of thing. And then went to the websites, had to find the right contacts people. I didn't hear back from a lot of people. Um, and I wasn't surprised because it was summer. And a lot of the people that would be interested in doing this would be out hiking. They'd be out doing things. They wouldn't be sitting there looking at their emails. And so I divided up all of these contacts among my students. And so I have a class this semester. And they've all got 17 to 20 contacts. And the idea is they have a hierarchy of contacts. and so. First, they send an email. And then if they don't hear, they send a follow-up email. And then if they don't hear, they do a phone call until they actually talk to somebody and not leave a message. And the goal is to do a Google Hangout or Skype with people face-to-face. -face. Because I think if you're asking people to give up some of their time, you know, not write a check, but give up some of their time, then you want to develop a relationship. And so we're trying to use social media to form community 
um, all those things that they say social media can't do. So it's kind of an experiment. So, so that's their form, and it feeds into an Excel spreadsheet. And so every time they make a contact, it shows up in the Excel spreadsheet. So, okay. And so we have a GoFundMe. We're doing a little better than that right now. So we've, um, and so sometimes people say, well, can you do this if you don't raise any money? And we can. You know, if um, I can pay for Saint and Me, I'm applying for a sabbatical, I can take up the time. But um, our, our goal is actually about $85,000 um, because we'd like to supply everyone with food, shelter, water, all of those things, everyone who's a part of this. Um, and we'd like to hire one person who could do the whole thing, who would be somebody there. Um, we call it a hospitality hiker. And it's, um, I can do a lot of things. I'm pretty upward body, um, but I can't get off the trail by myself. So it would be that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and so, and again, so we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have GoFundMe. Um, and this is a sample of the, the, an email that I sent and my students for their first email, they just kind of adapted that a little bit and put themselves in it. Okay. And then we have, Saint has her own blog now. And so she's become extremely egotistical since this. And so, um, so this is her first one, you know. And, um, and I, Saint calls me mummy. Um, and so, so Saint's gonna, we're, we're trying for at least every other week, if not every week. Um, we, we really want to reach out to every group, and we think a very important group is children. Um, and so this is particularly targeting uh, children in fourth to sixth grade. Uh, but I love it, and all my students love it, and I think you know, a lot of people enjoy it. And so it's that, that message of, of what's possible, and so we really want to get that out. And so um, Saint will be blogging about her, her visit to, to Unity you know, very soon. And so, okay. um, and so Looking back on Katahdin, we had, um, I'm just gonna, yeah, we have a we have a video that it's, we have this black hole, but it's actually our other video, and so we talked to the people, um, a lot of the people who were part of Katahdin, and we asked them to reflect and talk about what they gained, and what was the right stuff, what was important to do this, and and what they take away, and so. Um, there are two different cameras, and so the beginning and end, it's me holding my laptop. And so if it doesn't look um, the same, it's because I've got my laptop like this. And so, okay. Oh. Here we go. Hi.
people in the group, you know, taking it as a, as a collective and organic uh, unit. I think you have to be uh, very open-minded, um, patient, humble uh, person, and you also have to have a really positive attitude. You can kind of roll with the punches uh, and adapt. So that's what we're going to do. From March until October 2017, we'll be through hiking in AT. This is that opportunity to transform your life in the of your life. We have openings for hundreds of volunteers, including the perfect spot for you. Please join us. So that's, uh, that's my prepared part, uh, but I know that there's probably things that people would like to know about, and so I would love to have some questions. So the map was a class called Evolving Media. Evolving Media. Evolving Media. And so it hadn't occurred to me to do it in that class, but I have a friend who teaches at Clemson, and he had a friend who teaches at Clemson who had a, a graduate marketing class, and said, oh, Mike would love to have his students work with you, and then when I was talking to Mike, Mike said, oh, you know, are you doing this with your students? So I did that with them in the spring, and then the, the contacts things, and uh, I have two classes this semester. One is called Professional Communication, and then I have a Marketing Communication class that, that's Saints Blog and the different things on the website. And so um, I felt a little reluctant to do it at first, and I talked to our administration about it, and they said, no, this is a great opportunity. Yeah. And so it's, it's a, a, an opportunity for people to do something that's going to make a difference very tangibly. And so, so it's actually three, yeah, um, and so, and it's, it's nice for them, it's a 501c3, so it's a separate entity, but if they have any questions, you know, the, the, the pr president is right there, and so they're able to get their questions answered very quickly. Yeah. 
I had Saint for six years, um, just a little over six years. I got her the end of August in um, 2010. And so, um, you know, so Saint saved my life. Um, but she, because of Saint, I can live just with Saint. And so Saint does, she opens and closes the doors and turns the lights on and off and picks up things. Um, um, I'm klutzy anyway, so my upper body works much better than my lower body. But, and so she picks things up um, and she, um, she keeps me from rolling onto my back, which is really painful. And so, and that's something that she, she just figured out on her own. Um, she just does really, um, if there's something I can't reach, she can jump up on a table or a counter and get it for me. And so um, she's much better than any human personal care attendant would be. Um, not that people aren't nice, but they have to get to the house and weather happens and, uh, and she works really cheaply. You know, a few pe pieces of pepperoni and she's good, so. Um, and I think she's really happy because I think she feels totally needed. And so the only time we're separated is she did not go to the top of Katahdin when we did it, but she will this next time. So we're, we're going to have a dog carrier. Um, but the only other time is when she gets a bath a couple of times a year, and she, she screams, doesn't cry, because it's like, you can't, you can't go without me. You know? And so she feels like, you know, she's my legs, which she, she is. And so um, sometimes people will say, well, it's like you feel, think of her as your baby. And I said, no, I actually feel, think of her as my freedom, my independence. And so, um, and I love her t t to pieces, but she's the most important adaptive thing I have, you know, more important than my wheelchair, which is important. And so I think it's a, it's a very, I think people who have service dogs, it's a very special relationship because uh, you spend more time with your service dog than you do with you know, any, any human you know, or, uh, or pet, because she goes every place. So it's a great question. So, so I keep telling her we're going on a long walk, but to Saint Long Walk is, you know, where we parked. Getting over here was a long walk, and so, um, but she'll be okay. We did a, we did um, we went to Dabuli this summer, and she, she hiked six plus miles on a very hot, muggy day, and she, she did okay. And so, um, so she'll be, she'll be all right. I got to get her some special booties for the, the roughness and. Yeah. Yeah, right? She does hear me, but she's just like, you know, ignoring me. It's like, yeah. Okay. So this opportunity for assisting and she really like is open to community college students. Absolutely. Yeah. And so um, so you can do it as an internship. I'm, you know, I, I know there's certain things that you have to go through. Yeah. Yeah. If you if you wanted to get credit for it, um, if you wanted to do it when you were in in session, you know, in, in school, but um, I'm happy to work with anybody to make it uh, an opportunity. Um, early on in this planning part, uh, someone said, "Oh, it would just be so easy if you just had lots of money, and then you could just hire people." But that's not the point of it. You know, the point of it is to have people come in that they want to do it and, and, and not be paid for it. So um, if, if it's something that you can work out through Unity, um, I'm happy to work with whomever here to make it, make it happen. Yeah. If, if this was my class now, I'd call on everybody. I do this to my students. It's like, okay, everybody has to say something before we leave. Yeah. Um. Um, Great question. Um, an earlier class <coughs> asked about, did I think I was mentally and physically tough enough? <coughs> I think they put it a little nicer than that, but that's how I processed it. Um, and what I've heard, um, any through hikers here? Okay, yeah. Um, people I've talked to who've, who've through hiked it, yeah, or even a, a long section, say that um, it's 5% physical, 5% logistic, then 90% mental. Um, and so uh, in terms of, and people have asked me, you know, are you tough enough? And I think back to having to learn how to talk again and having to learn how to move again. 
Not that that's the same, but that was really hard. Um, and that was, um, I'm very verbal, and so that was, my, that was my life. That was my ability to continue to function, to be a productive human being. And so, um, and so I think when there are, and there's going to be, are people familiar with the, the, three, the three types of fun? Is that something that people, fun? Fun. Yeah, okay. So there's three types of fun. So type one is you're hanging out with your buddy. You know, you're just, um, and type two is, oh, this is a little bit tough, but it's going to make a great story. And type three is, this is horrible, and I can't believe I'm ever going to look back on this and think it was good. Um, and so, so in terms of recreation, you always wish people, you know, now you have lots of, of at least type two and not too much type three. But I'm sure there'll be some type three. Um, and so I think when discouragement wants to set in, um, I'm going to think of what it was lying in a bed, unable to move and speak, and think, OK, um, the mental got you through that. So the mental can get you through this. And so I think the, the mental challenge, uh, the physical is not insignificant. and so. We're trying to be so we have special equipment, you know, and we're, and that's one reason that we like, and we call them, you know, hiker and hospitality hiker. If there was, um, we need we need at least anybody fit, anybody who's a hiker can carry me. We learned that because it's, it's your legs, and so the way the weight is distributed. But I'd like to always have at least one lady because um, there are things that I, you know, like helping somebody get off the trail when you need to go to the bathroom. I just need somebody to help me balance, you know, and so, and that's something that I'd rather not do with a guy. And I mentioned this to the guys, and they're like, totally get that, Jackie, it's okay. <laughs> you know, that's all right. And so, um, and, and checking if there's any kind of, because when you're a paraplegic, your feeling's not there, but you still, you're, you're still there. And so, you want to be careful about sores and things like that, because once something like that ha starts, you know, it's really difficult. So that's something, but I think that that probably isn't a lot different. It's somewhat, but I'm not going to get blisters on my feet. You know, I might get blisters on my, on my, my buttock. And so those are kinds of things that I guess everyone, you know, works out. Um, the logistical piece is different because we've got a bigger group. And so it's figuring out, so we're, we're planning um, tents for three-person three tents that would be comfortable for two people, and three different stoves and, and food divided up. So if we have to split up sometimes to c when we camp, the ideal thing is that we'd all be in the same general area. But it's, it's that kind of planning, and how do you feed um, 10 people for seven months, even though many of those people will be different people, um, that planning, the, 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 the food and the, you know, all of that. So um, like any through hiker, only multiplied, and then with special equipment and stuff. So, so I think the logistical piece is um, probably the biggest thing, and so that's why we call that a battle plan because it's like planning a battle, a campaign. Um, but um, the the point of it is to pull people in, give them an opportunity to do something, and be part of something that's 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 big, um, and that's and that's hard. Um, my, so w up where I live, the, the big thing is, so it's three hours to Bangor, and uh, I have a lot of students who love Starbucks, and they want to go to a Starbucks and that, and so, um, so my analogy is, if I said, oh, let's all get my van and drive and get a coffee at Starbucks, there's not a lot of difficulty to that, so it has to be something that's, that pulls people together and, and um, brings out the best in people. And sometimes the worst of people, but we're, we're going to be positive about it. So I think it's the logistical, just the planning, the, the sheer scope of it. Um, and we can't, it's not a good idea, I think, for any through hiker to get up the day before and say, hey, I think I'm going to hike the AT you know, for the next six months. Um, but for us, it's, it's, it's more planning than that, because it's got so many additional pieces, I think. Yes, yeah, so we have. Yes, and so, oh, oh, uh-oh, I just broke something, probably. Oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, it's like I'm getting away from her. All right, good. That's, a, that's the bad thing about not having eyes in the back of your head. 
And so, for the Katahdin tribe, it's okay, Saint. They're not going to kill me, I don't think. Um, we, we got a thing online called the Piggy Backpack. And so, it's something that a guy in New Mexico developed um, for his daughter. So, it's not the, it's not the heavy duty, it's this one. Okay. And so, it came and it's got, you know, it had a nice belt and it had some padding. And my friend Al put these, and these are dish, dish drain pads. You know, he wanted some, um, and it came and it had down, down. Thank you. It had a bicycle seat on it, and I thought, wow, sitting on a bicycle seat for three days um, when you've got a body like mine. But even if you have an, uh, an, a body not like mine, it wasn't. And so um, Al made a seat to go on it. And so the seat is, um, he fabricated this. Oh, we need to hold on, yeah. Hold on it, to it. Yeah. So he made this seat, and uh, the metal is a speed limit sign that had been retired from Umpy. And then he, he welded it and bent it and everything and made it into this. To me, it looks like these old-fashioned little beach chair kind of things that you go and sit on the beach in. And so um, the, the cushion was donated. The cushion is called Sweet Cheeks, which I think is very funny. And so, and so we had that. And so, so this is what we did for Todden in. The problem with the carrier was you saw not the, just the guys swapping out, but them making adjustments. Because it wasn't very stable. The, it had this plate. And, and, but just this one plate. And so it would be wobbly. And then I'm in the seat on this. And we had this little pad. And after three days, I had such, uh, my pelvis was so bruised. Because going up and down in particular, it seemed like all my weight was against this metal plate. And this wasn't nearly padded enough. And so the day we hiked out, um, and these guys were so nice, but every step they took, I was just like, okay. So we knew we needed an improvement on this. And so my friend Al, who is regretting that he, he knows me, uh, designed a much better carrier. And so this one is, it's got this thing that is more molded to somebody's back. So the weight is distributed much better. And, the, and um, the straps are wider. They're padded. The padding here is um, antimicrobial, I think. And so you know, much better design. So the same seat, because the seat was, was awesome. So let's see if we can get the seat back on here. Um, so the seat wasn't the problem, and the stirrups weren't the problem. It was the, the, the harness. So you, you might have noticed in the film, the, the easiest way to do it is the person puts the harness on, and then the first carrier of the day, or after we take a break, uh, a couple of other people just, just drop me into the seat. And then when we started, we thought that they would have to put it down every time, which would be really cumbersome. And so they learned to swap out really quickly by two people supporting it, one person stepping out, the other person stepping in. And so we haven't, I just got this yesterday. I was so excited that Al got it done. So we're going to go and give it a, a field test next Sunday. We'll probably hike Mars Hill Mountain or something like that. And so, so we've got this and we'll have a special wheelchair that Al has designed um, because there are hiking wheelchairs out there, but none of them have independent wheel suspension or shock absorbers. Um, and Al said, you're going to be in this thing for seven months. You need, you need those things. And so he's got that design. And his last piece that he's designing is a dog carrier. So Saint will be fine for a lot of it, but there's no way that she could climb Katahdin on her own or some of the steeper places. And so special equipment that we're hoping ultimately to patent and make it widely available for search and rescue or you know, all kinds of other uses. Or if somebody just wants to get out on the trail for a couple of days and they can't walk, here's a really neat hiking chair that you can use and be quite independent. So, so yeah. So.
So lots of learning. We've done you know a lot of learning as we go along on this. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me.